Let's open our Bibles to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Now, 1st and 2nd Timothy, as well as the book of Titus, are typically referred to as the pastoral epistles. These three letters written to these two pastors, which I find very interesting, uh, because in back in 2nd Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, Paul tells Timothy to do the work of an evangelist, not a pastor. <laughs> so I think we all understand what people mean when they talk about these three letters being written to these two pastors, for they were certainly doing quite a bit of the work of a pastor. Now, before we actually get into our text today, uh, we're going to be looking at a few things by way of background and or introduction to the book. In fact, we're going to look at seven things for you note takers, you outliners, as we look at the who, what, where, when, why, and how of the book. So first of all, let's take a look at the who. Who wrote the book? Okay, three of you are awake. Good. Uh, yes, of course, Paul wrote the book. Look at verse one. It says, Paul. Now, there's very little debate among scholars today as to the authenticity of the Pauline authorship of this particular letter. Paul, of course, whose name was Saul, was a hater of the church, a persecutor of the church, until he met Jesus in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. Then he became a preacher for the church. He became one who proclaimed the truth. Oh, you can read about Paul's ministry and Paul's missionary journeys in Acts chapters 13 through 28. In all of that, we see that Jesus Christ not only changed Paul's life radically, but he used him mightily to accomplish the work that he set before him. And I got to tell you, this blesses me to no end. Because if God could take a person like Saul of Tarshish, who was a hater, an insolent man, a despiser, a persecutor, and change his life and use him for a great work, well, that means there's hope for all of us. Amen? Because it doesn't matter where we've been or what we've done. It doesn't matter how bad our past may be. Man, when we meet Jesus, when we come to terms with who Christ is to you and to me, there's a change in our lives. And he can use us in a mighty way just as he used Paul the Apostle. Number two, let's take a look at to whom this book was written to. According to verse 4 of Titus chapter 1, it was written to Titus. Now Titus is a Greek. He's a Gentile. Uh, his name means nurse. He's mentioned 13 times in the New Testament. Nine of those 13 times are mentioned in 2 Corinthians. He was a protege, a traveling companion with Paul, although interestingly enough, he's never mentioned in the book of Acts, although he is mentioned in the book of Galatians. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 6 that Titus had gathered a collection of money for the poor saints in Jerusalem. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 16 through 19 that Titus also delivered the second letter of Paul's to the church at Corinth. So we get quite a bit of information about young Titus, uh, not from the book of Acts, but from other of Paul's epistles. And as we've mentioned, he's also mentioned in the book of Galatians in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. When Paul and Barnabas had gone to Jerusalem to talk to the Jews who had come to faith in Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 15, we call it the Council of Jerusalem. When the Jewish believers got together and said, hey, we think it's great that Gentiles are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. However, while they do need to believe in Jesus to be saved, they also need to adhere to the laws of Moses, to the rules, the regulations, the rites, the rituals that Moses laid down in the law, the sacrifices, the feast days, the festivals, as well as circumcision. Well, Peter stood up in the midst in Acts chapter 15 and gave a great discourse as to why the Gentiles couldn't burden that, a shoulder that burden that they nor their fathers could bear. And so the Jews 
recognized that they were saved by faith alone in Christ alone. So they were eliminated from adhering to all of the laws of Judaism, specifically the law of circumcision, as they came to that conclusion, uh, which no doubt uh, Titus was thrilled at the outcome. Now, this brings us to the third thing we want to look at, and that is the what. What is this book all about. Well, the key theme to the book, or what the book is all about, deals with the health or well-being of the church. The health or well-being of the church. This book gives young Titus, this pastor in the island of Crete, encouragement and instruction in how to deal with several different difficult issues in the body of Christ or in the church. He's going to deal with the qualifications for the leadership in the church. He's going to deal with the false teachers that were infiltrating the church. He's going to deal with people that belong to the church. He's also going to tackle the issue of government as it pertains to the church. And so the key theme or what the book is all about deals with the health or well-being of the church. In fact, uh, the word sound is used five times in these three chapters. The word sound means health or well-being. Being Being of sound mind, we might say they have a healthy mind. And this is an idea that's translated as it pertains to the church. Because the church in Crete was not a healthy church. Uh, There were no elders, no bishops, there were false teachers. In fact, according to verse 12 of Titus chapter 1, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Boy, what a great church to pastor, huh? Now, (laughs) so that seems to be the key theme to the book. Now, the key verse to the book is found in verse 5 of chapter 1. Take a look. The key verse in Titus 1.5, Paul said, For this reason I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I command you. So the, the church was out of order. They were lacking leadership. So Paul having great confidence in young Titus to put him on the island of Crete and install him as the pastor of the church. Well, let's come to a fourth thing we want to look at, and that is the where. Where was this book written? Well, we're not really sure exactly where Paul penned this letter. Some believe it was in Macedonia or mainland Greece. Others believe it was written in the region of Achaia or the Grecian peninsula in the city of Corinth. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3, Paul was on his fourth missionary journey, which comes after Acts chapter 28, a journey that's not recorded. And most believe that's probably when 1 Timothy and Titus were written during this area of Macedonia or Corinth, though we can't be sure. So we might not know where this book was written, but we do know where this book was written to. According to verse Um, verse 5 it was written to the island of of Crete where Titus was at this time so this is where the book was written to to Crete now the island of Crete is one of the largest islands in the Mediterranean it's south of the Aegean Sea just south of the region of Achaia um, the peninsula if you will of uh, of, of Greeks, we would say. Now, um, many of you have probably traveled the islands there in the Mediterranean, and if you've went to Malta or followed the footsteps of Paul, you've probably went to the island of Crete. Uh, you'll recall it's a beautiful island, very fertile. It's a, the largest island in that area. It's about 165 miles long. It It's kind of a pie-shaped, wedge-shaped. It goes from like 7 miles to 35 miles wide. It's very lush, very fertile, as we mentioned. Uh, There's a mountain range on the island. It raises some 8,100 feet above sea level. So this is where 
the letter was written to. Now, let's take a look at a fifth thing we want to look at, and that is the when. When was this book written? Most believe it was written around 62 to 64 AD. It would seem that Paul wrote Titus as well as 1 Timothy shortly after his first Roman imprisonment in the Praetorium guardhouse, mentioned in Philemon uh, chapter 1, verse 13. Of course, that would be after the events of Acts chapter 28, which are not recorded. Number six. The sixth thing is why. Why is this book so important? Well, this book is important because it lays down several important guidelines for pastors and church leaders in dealing not only with issues of the church, but people in the church. And anytime church leaders deal with the issues of the church and people in the church, it needs to be done according to the Word of God. Because the Bible is the final arbitrator of truth. It's the line of demarcation that enables you and I to deal with circumstances and issues in the body of Christ as well as the people who are the body of Christ. Because you know as well as I do, man has come up with a lot of weird, wacky, and weigh out ideas about how to deal with certain issues and certain people. And while some of them might make sense and seem reasonable and rational from a, a secular standpoint, ultimately, the Word of God is the final authority in how you and I should deal with the body of Christ as a whole. Well, let's come to the seventh and final thing we want to look at by way of background and or introduction. And that's the how. How is this book divided? Well, we've divided these three chapters into three very simple sections in dealing with the church. The first section deals with the leadership of the church. That is in chapter one. As Paul deals with the issue of qualifying the elders and bishops for a leadership role in the body of Christ... The second section deals with people in the church. People in the church. That is chapter 2. Paul's going to deal with older men, older women, younger men, younger women, servants, and the like. The third and final section deals with the government and the church. That is chapter 3. As Paul deals with the relationship between the secular government and the body of Christ as a whole. How should we act? How should we react? What should we be like as it pertains to external oversight we call the government? And we'll look at that, Lord willing, in chapter 3. Now, this brings us to Titus chapter 1. And the second bit of introduction we want to look at in our time together today. The first introductory section dealt with the who, what, where, when, why, and how of the book. The second introductory section is very typical of Paul in verses 1 through 4, before we get in the first section of the book, which deals with the leadership of the church. So let's pick up our reading in Titus chapter 1, verse 1, reading down through verse 4 in our study today. Titus 1.1, 1, 1, Paul a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledgement of the truth, which is according to godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me, according to the commandment of God our Savior." To Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now in these first four verses, we have a very typical introduction to Paul's epistles. And we're going to look at two things. It deals with two people. First of all, it deals with Paul in verses 1 through 3. 
And of course, second, it deals with Titus in verse 4. So let's take a look at Paul in verses 1 through 3. And if you're taking notes or outlining, uh, we're going to look at three aspects of Paul's life that are mentioned here. Number one, the first thing involves Paul's ministry. Paul's ministry. In verse 1, Paul's ministry involves two things. First of all, he's called a servant of God. So the first part of Paul's ministry involves him being a servant, a servant of God. Interestingly enough, this little phrase, servant of God, is only mentioned here. Nowhere else in the entire New Testament does Paul ever call himself a servant of God. It's always a servant of Christ. You say, wow, Clark, that's kind of interesting. Why does he make the change up here? I don't know. I'm not sure. If I had to guess, and I do, I would say he's drawing a beautiful picture or parallel, if you will, between Jesus and God because they're one. Doesn't matter if he's a servant of Christ or a servant of God because the Father and Jesus Christ are the same. They're one. Read John chapter 10, verse 30. But the point here is that he is a servant. He's a servant. The word servant or doulos used 127 times in the New Testament is our English word for slave. It's a foot washer. It is one of the lowest possible positions you can have, earthly speaking. However, it is the highest possible position you can have, heavenly speaking. It's okay to be great. If you desire to be great, there's nothing wrong with that. But what does that mean? Well, Jesus explains it to us in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. He says, you know, the rulers of the Gentile lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your servant slave. Wow. So the greatest position we can have is that of a servant, a foot washer, a slave. So again, it's okay to desire to be great. And if you want to be great, if you want to be first, right on, go for it. What does it mean? Well, it means to be a slave, a servant of all. Because Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, He didn't come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many, as verse 28 of Matthew 20 declares. Now here's the thing about being a slave, about being a servant. All slaves have a master. All servants have somebody over them, telling them what to do and when to do it. Now if we claim to be servants of God like Paul, we're slaves of God. He is our master. Thus we must submit to his authority. We must do what He tells us to do if we truly are servants of God. And the thing about that is we can only have one master. That's what Jesus said, by the way, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 and 25. He says we only can serve one master. So the question for all of us is pretty simple. Who are we serving? Are we serving ourselves? Are we serving the flesh? Are we serving the world? Are we serving the things of the world? What, what has lordship over our lives, we might say? What's controlling us? Because whatever is or whoever is, that's our master. And hopefully, we've relinquished our will to the will of God. Thus, like Paul, we, can, we too can say we are servants of God. But Paul's ministry involves a second thing in verse 1. He's not only a servant of God, but he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle of Jesus Christ. Now the word apostle, apostolos, used 81 times in the New Testament, simply means a messenger, a sent out one, one who heralds or proclaims a message for someone else. And that's exactly what Paul was doing. Paul was not only picked by Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus, he was now a messenger for Jesus Christ, proclaiming or heralding the message of hope and eternal life. Now, there are some today who say, well, 
the disciples messed up in Acts chapter 1. You know, remember when Judas died, they had to pick a 12th disciple? And they picked Matthias in Acts chapter 1, verses 26 and on. There are those who say, well, the disciples blessed their heart. Uh, their intentions were good, but you know, they really messed up because they cast lots to find the 12. I mean, that's like rolling the dice. Who shall we pick as a disciple? I don't know. Let's roll the dice. And after all, this was before Acts chapter 2, before they were filled with the Holy Spirit, before the day of Pentecost. So there are those who say, well, you know, Paul is really the 12th apostle, and the disciples bless their heart. They kind of messed up. On one hand, I think I understand what people mean when they, when they say that. However, in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit did come down and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, says that Peter stood up with the eleven. Now, I'm no mathematician, but even I know that Peter plus eleven makes twelve. And so it would seem that Paul is not the twelfth apostle, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 14. And that blesses me to no end. Because, listen, Paul was used mightily by God. He wrote 13 books of the New Testament, 14 if you count the book of Hebrews, and some scholars do. And if he was an apostle, unlike the 12, that means it paints a parallel for us. Because in a very general sense, we too are apostles. We're messengers. We're sent out ones. We're ones to herald the truth of eternal life in Jesus Christ. Oh, we might not be used as mightily as God used Paul, but he certainly can use us to be those who are sent out to preach and proclaim the truth. So that deals with Paul's ministry. Uh, back to Titus chapter 1. Let's come to the second aspect of Paul's life. We said there were three. The first involved Paul's ministry. The second involved Paul's mission. Paul's mission. In verses 1 and 2, look at the middle of verse 1 in Titus 1. It says, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth, which is according to godliness, in hope of eternal life, which... God, who cannot lie, promised before time. Now, it's interesting there in verse 1. It says, Paul, he's a servant of God, an apostle of Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. Now, don't misunderstand. Paul's apostleship, Paul's servanthood, wasn't because of the faith of God's elect. The word according, kata, means for or in respect to. So Paul's apostolic mission and his servanthood was for the faith of God's elect. Why did God choose Paul to be a servant and an apostle? Well, it was for the faith of those who would come to faith in Jesus Christ. It's for the sake of God's elect, we would say. And his mission in light of that involves three things. First of all, it involves faith. Faith. Now, faith is something that we all have. We all have faith. Romans 12, 3 says God's dealt to each man a measure of faith. The faith that Paul had was in Jesus Christ and his ability to bring salvation to God's elect. And we'll talk more on that in just a moment. Well, let's talk about it now. <laughs> Question. Question. Who are God's elect? Well, Clark, that's a good question. Some think it's speaking of the Jews, because throughout Scripture, the Jews are called God's elect. Others say it's speaking of those who would subsequently come to faith in Jesus Christ. So I'm not really sure exactly who Paul is talking about when he's talking about God's elect. I think from a practical standpoint... From an application standpoint for you and I, it could be speaking of everybody. Whether it's Jew or Gentile, whether it's God's chosen elect or those that God will choose or elect. Follow me? Now when we talk about election, a lot of people have problems with this because it deals with the sovereignty of God. 
I have no problem with it at all because God is sovereign. He can do what He wants, when He wants, to whom He wants to do Him to. He's God. We are not. You say, well, Clark, does God elect? Yes, He does. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, the Bible says you and I are the elect. <laughs> in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible says He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, the Bible says, for whom He foreknew, He also predestined. So yes, God elects, God chooses, and God predestines. There's no doubt about that. But God's sovereignty does not negate the free will of man. We still are called free moral agents. In fact, in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, Paul said, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Joshua 24, 15 says, choose this day whom you will serve. We all have a choice to make. You say, well, how do I know if I'm chosen? Simple, choose. <laughs> if you want to be chosen by God, choose God and you'll be chosen. Now, he obviously knew ahead of time who would choose him. So apparently his election and his predestination is based on his foreknowledge. Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew he predestined. So God knows ahead of time who's going to choose Him. So His sovereignty does not negate our free will. So the first aspect of Paul's mission involves faith. Faith of God's elect. Number two, it involves truth. It involves truth according to verse 1. In fact, Paul talks about the full knowledge of the truth. Paul wanted to bring God's elect to the full knowledge of the truth. Now what's truth? Oh, it's the Word of God. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Your Word is truth. Now, there's a lot of truth in general. Don't misunderstand. A lot of things are true. However, the truth to get to heaven comes through the Word of God, the full knowledge of the truth. And note carefully, according to verse 1, it's according to godliness. So what's the purpose of coming to the full knowledge of the truth. Not only eternal life, but it has to deal with temporal life. It's according to godliness. Question. Does God desire for us to live godly? Oh yes, absolutely. No question about it. And that involves the Word of God. And Lord willing, when we get to chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, we're going to see that it's God's Word that tells us to live godly, and it's God's grace that enables us to live godly. More on that in chapter 2. Hold that thought. It might be a few weeks. You might want to jot it down. <laughs> Number three. The third aspect of Paul's mission involves hope. Not just any hope, according to verse 2. It's hope of eternal life. Paul's mission was to bring the hope of eternal life to God's elect. And that's based on two things, according to verse 2. Number one, it's based on the person of God. It says, God can not lie. Same thing in Hebrews 6.18. It's impossible for God to lie. You know there's some things God can't do, right? You ever, hear somebody, you ever hear somebody say, well, God can do everything. No, He can't. The Bible says He can't lie. <laughs> Follow me? There's several things God can't do, and we'll save that for another study. But the point is, one aspect of our hope in eternal life is based on the person of God. He can't lie. But the second thing involves the promise of God, which speaks of eternal life according to verse 2, which He promised us before time began. And this could very well help us to explain Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 where the Bible talks about the Lamb of God being slain before the foundation of the world. When was Jesus Christ crucified? In the eyes of God. Before the foundation of the world. It's amazing. So our hope of eternal life is based not only in the person of God but the promise of God. 
And this hope that you and I have, listen gang, it is not just for eternal life. It's the same hope in the same Lord for temporal life, for every moment of every day in life. In fact, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that he's begotten us again to a living hope. And let's face it, sometimes we go through some very difficult times in our lives. We have some ups and downs, some struggles, some <laughs> real traumatic situations. And sometimes we feel hopeless. We feel like we've lost hope. But in, through, and because of Jesus Christ, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're dealing with, we have a living hope. Our hope is not just for the there and the then. Our hope is for the here and the now. Number three and finally. We said there were three aspects to Paul's life in this introductory session. We've looked at Paul's ministry. We've looked at Paul's mission. Now, number three, and finally, it involves Paul's message. Paul's message. Look at verse 3. It says, But has in due time manifest or revealed his word through preaching, which was committed to me, according to the command of God, our Savior. So Paul's message involved preaching the word. Paul was a preacher of the word. Man, that was the message he brought forth. Listen to what he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 2.1. In 1 Corinthians 2.1, Paul said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of the wisdom declaring to you the testimony or the word of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words or human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul understood that faith, truth, and hope comes not only by the Word of God, but by the power of God. It wasn't fancy words or flowery speech. And that blesses me to no end. Because as we, like Paul, are proclaimers of the truth, preachers of the word, whether we're at work, at home, at school, at play, on vacation, wherever we're at, when we're telling people about Jesus, the burden is lifted from our shoulders and thinking that somehow it's up to us. It's because of our great ability to speak. It's because we're dynamic or powerful. It's because we're, you know, mighty orators. Hey, are you kidding me? God uses donkeys and rocks. Uh, It's a miracle He uses any of us at all. (laughs) The power's not in the preacher. The power's in what's being preached. It's not in the orator. It's what's being orated. That's where the power is. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans Chapter 1, verse 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for all who believe. And I got to tell you, that takes the burden right off of me, thinking that somehow it's up to me to get people saved. No, the power's in the Word. And that's Paul's message. And I say, praise God to that. Well, back to Titus chapter 1. We said there were two people in this introductory section. The first, of course, was Paul. The second is Titus. Titus, that's in verse 4. And we would mention two things about young Titus in verse 4. Number one, the first thing involves his relationship to Paul. His relationship to Paul. Take a look at verse 4. He said to Titus, my true son in our common faith. Boy, what a relationship he had with Paul. He was his true son. Son. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, Timothy is called a true son. In fact, only Timothy and Titus are ever called Tim- Paul's true sons because they had caught Paul's vision and Paul's heart for the ministry. They understood Paul's desire for the church and how the church should operate because Paul was hearing from God. And they caught that vision, and they ran with that vision. 
You know, Sally and I have been so blessed to be able to sit under Pastor Chuck Smith at Calvary Costa Mesa for so many years. To, in fact, Sally got saved there at Calvary Costa Mesa in 1976. <laughs> and, uh, and we were so blessed to catch that vision that God gave Chuck just for the simplicity of the church. You know, Pastor Chuck always said, feed the sheep and love the sheep. Keep it simple. Feed the sheep, love the sheep. And it's been such a blessing to see so many here at the barn that God has raised up over the last 20 plus years to catch that vision of just, hey, we just love each other and we, we minister to one another through the word of God. Church is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. We just teach the Bible. We just say what the Bible says and, and let God do everything else. And so this relationship that Timothy or that Titus had with Paul, amazing. He's his true son. Well, let's come to the second and final thing and we'll wrap this up right here in dealing with Titus. We looked at his relationship to Paul. Now number two, let's take a look at his blessings from Paul. His blessings from Paul. There are three of them. The first one in verse four is grace. Grace. It's a familiar word. It's the word karish, used 156 times in the New Testament. It means unmerited favor, getting what we don't deserve. And we all understand God's grace for eternal life. We realize we can't work our way to heaven. We're not saved by our good deeds or any effort on our part. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says we're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But God's grace goes far, far beyond eternal life. And Lord willing, when we get to chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, we're going to look at God's grace as it pertains to a very practical aspect of our life. And we'll look further at that, Lord willing, in our subsequent studies. So the first blessing involves grace. The second blessing in verse 4 involves mercy. Mercy. The word mercy, Elias, used 30 times in the New Testament, simply means compassion or quite literally holding back that which we deserve. Now grace is getting what we don't deserve. Judgment is getting what we do deserve. (laughs) But mercy is having held back that which we deserve. And it's kind of interesting because throughout Paul's writings, it's always grace and peace, grace and peace, grace and peace, the Siamese twins of the New Testament as they're often referred to. But here, only to Timothy and only to Titus does he add mercy. I find that interesting. As these two pastors who are pastoring these two churches, Paul is saying, oh God, have mercy on these pastors. Don't give them what they deserve because you know they're pretty messed up. So Lord, hold back mercy. You know, we have a tendency to look at religious leaders, pastors and elders as somehow they're way up here and, you know, we have this reverence for them. And I mean, obviously there's some reverence for the office of leadership in the church. Don't misunderstand. But look, I'm just just as messed up as you are. (laughs) And that's messed up. (laughs) Hey, look, we're all in this together. There's not one way up here and the rest of us way down here. No, we're all right here in God's eyes. So I'm real thankful that, that, that Paul asks mercy on these pastors. There's a third blessing, according to verse 4, and it's peace. Peace. The word peace, irene, used 92 times in the New Testament, simply means rest, tranquility, calmness. Lack of turmoil. I like peace. I like calmness. I like a lack of turmoil. Unfortunately, (laughs) that's typically not the case in our lives, is it? 
However, the problem that most of us face is we have a tendency to look for peace in the wrong place. In fact, we think peace is a place. We think, man, if I can just get out of California. Mm. <laughs> the land of fruit and nuts, I mean. <laughs> I can't have plastic straws anymore. <laughs> man, I'd find peace if I can get out of here. And we think the grass is always greener on the other side. I can just move to Texas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they got good guns there, cool guns. <laughs> oh, man, I'm gone. I'm out. Follow me? And we think that somehow peace is found in a place. Unfortunately, peace is not found in a place. True peace is found in a person the person of Jesus Christ. In fact, according to the end of verse 4, note carefully, class, it's from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace are from, notice the source of peace. It's from God. It's from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the giver of peace. In fact, in John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said, peace I give to you. My peace I give to you. He's not only the giver of peace. Are you ready for this? According to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, He Himself is our peace. And that ought to bless the socks off all our stinky little feet. Because if you have Jesus, you have peace. I always catch myself in prayer, God, give me peace, and I have to smack myself upside my pointy little head. Clark, you big idiot. You have Jesus. You already have peace. And the problem we often face is we think that because we have the peace of Christ, there shouldn't be any turmoil in our life. Hello. But even in the midst of turmoil, in the middle of what we're dealing with, we walk around with that goofy Christian grin on our face. We have peace. I I always think of Jesus and the disciples. You know in that little boat in the Sea of Galilee, remember the story? Jesus said, let's go to the other side. They get in the boat. They're halfway across the Sea of Galilee and a great storm is blowing. Man, the wind is raging. The waves are crashing. Their little boat is filling up with water. And Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat. He's out like a light. And the disciples said, Lord, what's wrong with you? My translation. Why are you sleeping? Do you not care that we're perishing? In other words, what's what's wrong with you? Why aren't you freaking out like the rest of us? See, what they failed to remember is Jesus said, let us go to the other side. He he didn't say, boy, I hope we make it to the other side. You know what I'm saying? He said, no, we're going to, look, we're going to, listen, gang, we're going to make it to the other side. No matter what we're going through or dealing with, it it might not be smooth sailing. There's going to be some storms. But man, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus who's asleep in the back of the boat. Because he's the author, the perfecter of our faith. And boy, what a, what a beautiful blessing this is. From Paul to young Titus, grace, mercy, and peace. Father, how thankful we are. Lord, for these few short minutes, just this opportunity to come and gather together and And Lord, turn our hearts toward you. (laughs) Lord, learning of you. Hearing from you. Becoming more like you. And Lord, we pray that by your spirit, you would help us, Lord, to be those servants, those apostles that you would choose to use in a mighty way to herald the truth of eternal life. Let it be so, Lord, we pray. 
In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer today for anything at all, be sure to come on up. After service, the pastors and the brothers and sisters will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, to serve you. Maybe you're listening live on the radio. Look, if you need prayer today, be sure to call the church. The pastors will be standing by to pray for you as well. And don't forget, after third service today, if you'd like to be baptized, maybe if you'd like to show your faith externally through water baptism, maybe you'd like to rededicate your life to the Lord publicly, or maybe you'd like to get baptized with your spouse or your family, be sure to come on back after third service. Bring a towel and a suit, and we've got white robes for you. And we'll be out there baptizing after third service. So if God's stirring your heart to do that, be sure to come on back. The water's warm. Pastor Rico says it's like 89 degrees. So the water's super nice and warm. Just for you. Well, okay for me too. But, uh, <laughs> and I pray that God would bless each and every one of your hearts. Man, that he would just pour out his Holy Spirit in your life. That he would enrich you with his love empower you with His grace that He would use you in a very real and practical way as you begin the first day of this new week. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a, have a great week in Jesus.